Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to get down my knees and pray. You need God. I need God. Are you ready? Stand to your feet and let's go before the Lord. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts and our lives today. We haven't come to hear from a man. We haven't come to hear from a woman. We have come to hear from the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. And God, we thank you for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts and in our lives today. We thank you, Father, that as you bless us, we can boldly approach the throne of grace and say, Lord, don't just bless us, but bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, there are brothers, there are sisters. We had asked that you bless them also. Bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest, Oak Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Foursquare Denomination. We thank you for Trinity, Emmanuel, Ecclesia, the way. We thank you, Father, for the great churches, San Bernardino Temple that is out there. We ask you to bless the Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters. At no time, Lord, do we think of ourselves or see ourselves as better than any of them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in your field, building one kingdom yours, not a man's. And I thank you for the wisdom of God where you have a church, a place with diversity, but the same Savior, the same word, but diversity in how they worship so that each person can find a place that's perfect for them. How wise you are. And God bless them as you would bless us. We're all in agreement. A great big shout, we say amen. Today, as we go to the word of the Lord, I'm going to have you go to Hebrews in the fourth chapter, verse number 12. In case you're keeping score, this is like the third or fourth time we've been in that verse. It's an amazingly powerful verse. I was excited to hear a couple of weeks ago Pastor Luke talking about God said and God said and how important the word of the Lord is. Amazing understanding. Then last week with Pastor Dan, he brought out of that same verse about the two-edged sword that God is one edge and you're the others and we need to speak it out of our mouths. Today we're going to be talking about, and here's the subject's title, the creative word of God. Before I read the verse to you, I want to ask you a question. I want you to listen just for a moment. What if I said to you that you could almost and practically, as long as it's in the will of God, design your future? You could design the way your family is going to act and be. You could design the kind of finances and your business adventures that you need. You could will design a marriage that you think would be phenomenal. And if I asked you, would you like to have a designer future? There isn't anybody in this room that wouldn't say, Pastor, I would love that. How does that happen? And yet most people never live a designer type life because the great designer himself is one who has designed a brilliant future for you. But we just settle for the mundane, boring, existing life that we think is handed out to us instead of the life that God has for us. And today as we look at the word of the Lord and how great it is and powerful it is, when it is properly used as it was with God himself who created the heavens and the earth, when it is proper, are you listening to me? When it is properly used, it creates a future with your children, your marriage, your finances, your dreams and your vision. And so today, what we're going to be doing is look at the word of the Lord 
to be an encouragement to you to understand the importance every day of the Word of God in your life. Are you ready? Yes. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse number 12, says it like this, For the Word of the Lord is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing into the division of the soul and the spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. In other words, it is an intruder in your life. It'll get in and expose who you are. It'll get in and show who you really are. It will expose your heart, expose your thoughts, expose your future, expose your life in every way. Now that can be a good thing in bringing the blessings of the Lord or it can be a lousy thing and keep you from the blessings of the Lord. God, in my studies with the Word of the Lord this week, God gave me four thoughts to share with you about the Word of God. Simple thoughts, if you will. Four thoughts about the Word. If you can understand these thoughts, and by the way, I want to just share this with you. Deborah and I have lived our life on these four thoughts that has taken us from where we were, which was down and out, to more than conquerors, overcomers. And if you have any interest in this at all, you can learn now instead of waiting until you're 60 years old before you finally figure out what life is all about. You never had a grandpa ever tell you anything about Jesus, nor did you ever have a grandpa display Jesus to you. So listen to Grandpa today. He wants to share a truth with you that changed, as I stand before you, a living memorial that changed the existence and brought a designer life into being. Four thoughts. Here's number one. Are you ready? Yes. I said, here's number one. Are you ready? Yes. Number one. Only a fool despises God's word. Yeah. And I know what you're thinking right there. That's not me. I'm not a fool. But I want you to know that I don't believe you're a fool either. But I think you should understand some things that maybe you don't realize. Oftentimes, God will use a word in Scripture. The word that God uses is misunderstood by us because we think of it in different terms than what God thinks of it. Let me give you an illustration. The word murder to you is the killing of someone else. And it is that also with God. But with God, it goes further than just the killing of someone else. With God, the word loveless, without love towards someone, is killing somebody. Isn't that bizarre? And when I use the word despise here, when I think of the word despise, it means something that I reject, something that I'm adamant against. It's something that I hate, something I can't stand, something that makes my skin crawl. It's something that I obviously don't want anything to do with. I, I, I obviously repel it. I remember one time someone gave me an oyster to eat. Now, some people, if you love oysters, that's cool. I'm happy for you. But I had that oyster halfway down and halfway up, and man, I couldn't stand that sucker. <laughs> I despise something slimy going down my throat. And I couldn't handle it. It was like this. This is how I despise. Ah! <laughs> but God's word despise is different. God's word despise means simply not placing an importance or a value on it. I can accept it. I cannot be against it. I can hear it. But when I treat it as if it's common and don't do anything with it as if it's valuable, 
I have now in the terms of God's thinking despised the word of God. Now let me say something to you. This is going to offend some of you. You might as well understand this. I'm not here to play love boat captain. I'm here to tell you the truth. When you despise the word of God, it keeps you from the blessings that you sincerely want in your life. And I would say that there's probably 80% of the people who attend this church that despise the word of God without even knowing they're in the position of despising. Because they simply do not put an importance on it. Oh, they'll hear it. Oh, they'll accept it. Oh, they'll talk about it. But they won't do much with it. And there's no value in it. And by the way, what you value, you place an importance on. If you had gotten an inherited solid gold watch that was worth about $24,000, $25,000 from some relative that left it to you, you would take that watch and you would place it in a special place. You'd put insurance on it. You wouldn't just leave it around. You would protect it. Why? Because it's valuable to you. But if you had a $15 Timex cheap little watch, whatever, and you would throw it around the place and not care about it at all. And sometimes when we treat the Word of God as if it's inexpensive and common, with no real importance on it, we become despisers and despisers of fools, the Word of God says. In Deuteronomy, the eighth chapter, verse number three, the Word of God makes it very clear and he says, and he humbled you and allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna with which you did not know nor did your fathers know. And then he goes on and he says these words, that you might know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Your life depends on the word of God being on the inside of you. Like breath that you take in, like your heartbeat that pulsates blood through your system, like the food that you take in from nourishment. More important than any of that is the Word of God. Because you live by the Word of God, not by the substance of this planet. And until you get to a place of seeing that, we find ourselves in the position of being despisers. And we become fools. Listen to what it says in Isaiah, if you will. In Isaiah, the fifth chapter, verse number 24. If you've got your Bible, you might want to go there and underline some really cool words. It says, therefore, as the fire devours the stubble. Can you imagine stubble just for a moment? Think of dried stubble weeds and fire hitting it. What's it do? It explodes. And the flames consume the shaft. After they've taken the wheat out of the, they leave a little product called the shaft. It's all dried out. And the flames hit that shaft. It explodes with fire. It doesn't just simmer and then finally blow. Man, it's just like ignites like gasping. So shall their roots be, shall be as rottenness and their bosoms will ascend like dust. Because they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. In other words, your whole life dries up and burns away as dust. Now look, you don't want that. You don't want to end your life miserable, divorced, unhappy, alone, broke, with nothing. No respect for anybody and no respect for yourself. No vision, no hope, nothing. Look, that's why you're here. So you don't end up that way. But when you despise, treat as if it has no importance and value. The word of God, you become this fool that despises. Listen to what the word of God says about someone who's not a fool in Acts, the 17th chapter, verse number 10. Acts, the 17th chapter, I'll read it to you. 
And when the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Bria, here's Paul and Silas are coming to this place. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Here we find them going to church. First thing they do. Now watch this. Verse number 11. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. These people were more fair-minded. These people now were special. God brings attention to them. Now they have the favor of the Lord. Now they've done something that caught the attention of God. Don't you want to do something that catches the favor of God, the attention of God? That's what these people did. Now let's see what it was that got their attention with God. In verse number 11, it makes it very clear. Here he comes along and he says this, they're more fair-minded than those of Thessalonica in that they receive the word of God with readiness and search the scripture daily to find out whether these things were so. What made them different than all the other people is they had a hunger for the word of God. They wanted it. They didn't despise it and become the fool that burns up life. Whew. What a thought. Second thought God gave me for you, me. We're talking about four thoughts about the word. Second one is this. You and I have got to place ultimate importance on it. Speaking of the word. I can't do it for you. I wish I could, I would. I know enough to do it. Well, let me explain something to you. Deborah and I, the biggest losers the world has ever known, got married. She's a drug dealer, I'm a weirdo. Been married so many times, I've probably married half of you. We meet up, no hope, no future, total and complete failures, in life. Here's what we did. Not knowing where to go, not knowing what to do, not knowing how to do it. Here and I committed to one thing, to take the word of God and make it the ultimate importance. That means above anything and everything else. That means above my feelings, above my thinking, above my training, above the world, above society, above economics, above every single thing, the word of God. If it said it, that settled it, that's the way it was. Even though I wanted to get angry, I wanted to get ugly, I wanted my feelings to come out. No, the ultimate word of God was replaced and the word of God came forth and I did what the word said instead of what I felt. And I stand before you today, just three years away from 70 years old, blessed in every area of our life. We love each other more today than we have ever in our life. We have the most wonderful children that all by their own choice serve God, most of which are pastors. We have grandchildren that are growing up and wanting to be pastors. Here's two ultimate losers designing their life around the blessings of the Lord. As a living monument to you, I stand as an old man trying to tell you with veins popping out of my neck the importance year after year after year after year of the word of the Lord being the ultimate choice of your decision-making process. What does God's word say? If I may, in Luke, the 11th chapter, there's this bizarre verse. Jesus is being told something by a, a woman. What Jesus is being told is truthful, but it's an amazing verse. In Luke, the 11th chapter, let's take a look at it together. And in verse number 27, and it happened as, as he spoke, speaking of Jesus, these things, a certain woman from the crowd 
raised her voice and said to him, <laughs> amazing, blessed is the womb of the, the womb that bore you and the breast that nursed you. Now, wait a minute. I'm talking about making the word of God your ultimate importance in life. Not your children, because your children won't make it without parents making the word of God first. Your marriage won't make it. Not your wife or your spouse. You won't make it. You call yourselves Christians all you want, but until the word of God comes out first as the ultimate importance in your life, your marriage won't make it. Your finances won't make it. This woman says to Jesus, blessed is your mother who from her womb bore you and her breast that fed you. Is that a true statement? Yeah. Absolutely. We need to respect that. Did Jesus criticize her? No. But what Jesus says next about it is about you. And she, he says, yes, here's what he really says. She was a blessing, but the ones that come after are going to be a greater blessing. I don't know if you've ever seen this. Watch it for yourself. Verse number 28. But he said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the, more than that, more than that, more than that. Yes, my mother's blessed for bringing me into the planet. Yes, my mother's blessed for feeding me with uh, uh, her breast. Yes, we should honor that. But more than the honoring and the blessing that she is, you are if you hear and do the word of God. There's a whole denomination of a billion people that worship Mary. That's fine. They can worship Mary if they want, as long as they don't miss Jesus. You follow me? Because this is, and, and, and that's fine. And, and uh, there's people praying to Mary. And I, that's fine. Go ahead and pray to Mary all you want, but you better pray to Jesus. Jesus is going to answer the prayer, not Mary. But, but, but let me, let's don't go there. Let's don't go there. That's not the point. That's not the point. The point is, as great as Mary is, the one who hears the word of God according to Jesus is greater yet and does the word of God is greater than Mary. You know that Jesus said the same thing about John the Baptist. As great as he is, he says, there's no prophet that's ever been like John the Baptist, but the ones that come after him may be even greater than him. That's you and me. Why? Because we get to hear the word and create the world around us with the word of God. Is anybody listening? But I can't make it the ultimate importance in your life. I can only stand before you with veins sticking out of my neck trying to get you to hear me and to believe this. Whew. Powerful understanding. Jesus makes this statement in John the eighth chapter. John the 8th chapter, if you go there in your Bible, verse number 30, he says it like this. He says, as he spoke these words, many believed unto him. And Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Can I ask you a question? What if you don't abide in his word? If you abide in my word, if you don't abide in the word, what if you just call yourself a Christian? What if you just go to church once in a while? What if you just hang out with other Christians every now and then? What if you're just not against the things of God? But he who abides, that means live, stays, dwell my word. In order for that to happen, you're going to have to make it ultimately important. Or my disciples. Indeed. Verse 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall do what? Make you free. I don't know about you, but I like being free. Free of problems, stress, free of anxiety, worry, free of all the concerns of the planet. Don't give a flip what anything says. Got it all under control, because God's under control. Anybody listening? 
Pretty cool, huh? We're talking about four thoughts about the word. Number one, only fools despise the word. Number two, you got to place ultimate importance on the word. But I like number three. This is wild. Are you ready? This is really a wild one. Number three, put the word before the works. You say, what in the heck does that mean? Put the word before the works. It's as simple as this. The word creates the works. The works don't create the word. I can put in my good time serving the Lord and miss the word of God and miss the destiny and the purpose of why I'm here on this planet. Because the works is not as important as the word. Now I know what James says, I'll show you my faith by my works. So we don't diminish that. All of us are called by God to do something. But what we do is produced because of the word of God on the inside of us. Because what we do doesn't produce the word. What we do is produced by the word. Are you following me? And what you do takes place of the word you are now in trouble. Even though what you do is good for God. You gotta hear this. If what you do is good for God and you replace the word by what you do, then you have just missed God. Are you following me? And that's why I say to the 1,500 volunteers of this church that make this place work, you can volunteer at Children's Church, you can volunteer at the back door, you can volunteer at prayer meetings, you can volunteer at youth ministry, you can volunteer at FTC Food Distribution Center, you can volunteer on the buses, you can volunteer. There's always a bridge to go under, there's always a place to go, there's always some works to be done, and we thank God for every one of you, but may I say this to you, when your works, what you do, takes the place of the Word, you're now getting the raw end of the deal and it won't be long for you're not in church anymore. You say, what do you mean? All kinds of things will distract you. Sometimes people will come and they'll volunteer doing the work and they will now say that's their church and go home and not get the word. You following me? And when you do that, you just get screwed. I'm too old to care what you think about me. That's what you do. You just get screwed. And you haven't come to church to have that happen to you. Well, listen to me. So you put in all kinds of time thinking that's what you need. Worst thing we ever did is when we were a young church, had about a couple hundred people in church, had a picnic on Saturday. We had a picnic on Saturday. You know what happened? They'd all come out and church picnic on Saturday. Had three, four, five hundred people. Man, I was so pumped. I said, man, tomorrow they're going to be in church. Ninety people showed up for church. That Saturday became their Sunday morning. And when your works take the place of the word, you get the raw end of the stick. I'll prove it to you. Is that okay? Go with me if you will in your Bible. Let's take a look at it. You're right there anyway. Let's take a look, uh, look at the word of the Lord. Luke, the 10th chapter, starting in verse number 38. In verse number 38, let me read it to you. Listen to, the, listen to this. I'm going to show you exactly that your works are not as important as you getting the Word of God. And if you can work and get the Word, fine. But if you can't work and get the Word, then you shouldn't be working. Because the Word is more important than anything. It's the ultimate importance of your life. Remember that verse 38. Now it happened as they went into a certain village that a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. And also sat at Jesus' feet. Here's Mary. Sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Here's Mary. Did you get it? Sitting at Jesus' feet, hearing the word. Wow. But Martha was distracted with much serving. 
You can be distracted by much serving and not get the word of God like you need to. She was all wrapped up in what she was doing, her works. It became more important than the words of Jesus. So she goes to Jesus. She really bothered by this. She goes to Jesus and she says these words and she approached him and said, can you imagine someone coming to the king of glory, the one who created the heavens and the earth, God almighty, Jesus himself, and now gonna tell him how it ought to be? This is a tenacious woman. She is really ticked off. She's sitting there, and you know what I'm talking about, girls. Have you ever had a relative where you clean up after dinner and you do all the work and they sit in there and talk to everybody? Come on now, let's talk about forgiveness. <laughs> you know it's true. Martha's really distracted by all of her servant and she approaches him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me alone to serve? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said, you stupid woman, Mary, get in there and help Martha a lot. It's more important that you work than hear my word. Did your Bible say that? <laughs> you know it doesn't. If it does, you ought to tear that page out and buy a real Bible. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. Wait a minute. Have you ever noticed people that don't have the word are always frustrated? Always worried, always troubled, always full of anxiety, always wondering, always can't sleep, always got problems, always rehearsing things. Why? Because they didn't hear the words of Jesus. Now watch this, verse number 42. But one thing is needed, Mary. One thing is needed, and Mary has chosen the good part in which will not be taken away from her. In other words, your works are not as important as you getting the word, but don't stop working. Just make sure that when you work, you get into church after you work and get the word. Don't just go home, get the word of God. Why would you do that? Number two, you have made the ultimate importance of your life the Word of God. Why would you do that? Because you are not a fool who despises the Word of God, takes it lightly as if it's not important and has no value. Is anybody listening? We're talking about four, four thoughts of the Word of God. Here's number four. Speak it out loud. I didn't say think it. Speak it. I have not found anywhere in the scripture that says faith comes by thinking the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You've got to hear the word of God. When you speak out into this atmosphere the power of God that changes lives, the proof of that is you. You heard the word of God and it changed you on the inside. That same power is released. And now you have a designer life. And what I mean by that, you've got to speak the word of God. For an example about your finances, Father, I'm blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed coming, blessed going, everything I put my hand to, I shall prosper. You will meet all of my needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And I thank you for it, Father. You make all grace abound towards me that I always have all things and have an abundance for every good work. And Father, may I also say about my finances, you give me the power, the strength to get wealth. You gotta speak it. About your health, I'm healed by the stripes of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I've got a sound mind. I'm walking in the ways of the Lord. But he went about all the land doing good and healed them all. And I thank you, God, I'm one of them that's healed by the blood of the Lord. You gotta speak it out of your mouth. When you're getting a little old and creepy and starting to get around slow, oh, thank you, God, let me tell you how it is. I'm renewed by the, like an eagle. My joints are fat and flourishing, and I'm refreshed and renewed every day by the things of the Lord. When the devil's coming against you, chase you, now let me make it very clear. The Bible says, resist the devil and you will flee. And no weapon formed against me shall prosper. You speak it out loud. 
We got a whole world sitting back waiting for God to create their destiny when your destiny is in your mouth and you need to let it out. It will create your designer family, your designer kids, your designer future, your designer finances. You may be down and out about yourself. God, I'm a king's kid. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I'm blessed in the city and blessed in the field. Blessed coming, blessed going, that everything I put my hand to, I shall prosper. I thank you, God. I belong to you. I've got your DNA and belong to your family. I'm a king's kid. And you got to speak it out loud so you hear it and the, every demon in hell around you hears it. Because when they finally realize you're going to continue in this mode speaking it out loud, someone comes up and says, oh, you don't really believe that. Oh, yes, I do. Well, that's not what happened. Doesn't matter if it's not what happened. It will happen. How do you know that when God said and changed the world from darkness to light and built in the days and the sun, God said, God said, God said, God said, Genesis first chapter. How do you know it wasn't 10,000 years from the time he spoke it to the time that it happened? Let me tell you something about God. He's not in some timetable. You just speak it out and believe it's going to come to pass. Debbie and I just spoke it and 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 spoke it. People thought we were crazy. Uh huh. I'm so crazy, I'm blessed out of my sock. You know why? Grandpa's telling you something. It works. Four things. Only fools despise God's word. Take it as if it has no value. Treat it as if it's common. Place very little in real importance on it. Number two, place ultimate, ultimate importance on it, the word of God. Number three, put the word before the works. Don't stop doing the works. Just make sure you keep getting the word every single day. Number four, speak it out of your mouth. Whatever you're believing God for, speak it out loud and watch God do something great. If God spoke to you today, give him a shout out of your mouth. I just want to make sure everybody's all right with God. Nothing could be worse then you coming in here, hearing the word of God, singing the songs, come on, you know God spoke to you today. Cut out the bull, you know it. You got something from God. Walk out of here, your heart stops, you die, you open your eyes in hell. I wanna make sure that doesn't happen. You know that you are out of sync with God. You know you're not right where you need to be. And you know you're in trouble if you should die. You may think you're going to go to heaven because you're a good person. But nowhere does it say you get to think your way into heaven. Nowhere does it say you get to be a good person and you get to heaven because you're good. Nowhere does it say because you say you love God. Nowhere does it say because you're not some other religion. Maybe you're not Jewish or Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist or some other faith other than Christianity that you're a Christian. It doesn't work that way. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you the truth. Because you're going to die and go to hell. But Jesus made a away for you and paid the price for you to go to heaven. But he said in John, the third chapter, how to get to heaven. He tells you exactly how to get there. He said, you must be born again. Now, born again right away turns a lot of people off. 
Because we have this image of born again people that are idiots and fanaticals and goofballs, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. We have that image because of Hollywood making them like crazy people in movies to try to stop you from really giving Jesus all of your heart and life. Listen to what born again really means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. And a lot of you need to do this. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. All or nothing. Somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, honor you enough to stop playing church and tell you like it is. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus. And you have got to give him all of your heart. You are the only one that can give him all of your life. He won't steal it from you. He's not a thief. He's not a conniver to take it from you. He's not a manipulator to make you do it. He gives you the free will choice to give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. And here you are today in this safe and friendly place. We've laughed, we've clapped, we've sung, we heard the word of God. Today you couldn't be in a better atmosphere to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. In fact, God brought you here. This is a divine appointment you have with God. So you can give God all of your heart and all of your life. You say, well, Pastor Jim, you say it's all or nothing. Yep, it is. And I'll prove it to you, last book in the Bible. The last book is the book of Revelation. Jesus himself is speaking. He says, I'm coming again. Don't you know he is? I just don't know when, nobody does. He says, I'm coming again, and when I come, I better find you hot, or I better find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he just said in that crude statement, an almost rude statement? Do you know what he just said? He said, people who call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. And they're gonna get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Let me define for you what lukewarm is. Little in, little out, little up, little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. Jesus is something, but he's not everything. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Are you listening to me at all? That's lukewarm. And today is your day of salvation. In a moment, you need to get right with God by giving him all of your heart and giving him all of your life. You say, well, how do I do that? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three. I'll pop my hands together, and you'll hear this sound. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. Here's what you're saying by the raising of your hand. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I want to give God all my heart, give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up and put it right back down. Simple as that. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, if you're asking me to raise my hand, I, I don't know if I can do that. I'll feel funny. People that I came with will see me. People behind me will see me. I'll, I'll feel weird. Guess what? Can I tell you something? Who cares what people think? If you care more about what man sees and thinks about you instead of what God sees and thinks about you, you're not going to make it anyway. Get off of that. Get over it. And let's go for God. Yeah, you'll feel funny raising your hand. Who cares? Jesus felt bad going to the cross for you, but he did it for you. You can raise your hand in a safe place like this for him. Today is your day. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? Again, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your life, get ready to put your hand up. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, hey, make sure. Make sure, don't go out of this place unless you know for a fact that today's your day of salvation. I'm counting to three, I've done my job. I'm popping my hands together. 
Now it's up to you. Your call. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. Back over here. There's seven. Back over here. God bless you. There's eight. There's nine. There's ten. Thank you. There's eleven. Thank you. There's twelve. Thank you. There's thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Thank you. Back here, sixteen. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Real quick. There's sixteen wise. There's seventeen. Thank you. Up on top, there's eighteen. There's nineteen. There's twenty. Right here. God bless you. Where are you? Twenty-one. You know you need to get your hand up. In the foyer, tell an usher. You come on in. Anybody else? Real quick. Anybody else? There's 21. Thank you. Anybody else? Real quick. Where's 22? There's 22. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 22 wise people. Here's what I want you to do. All 22 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff. Hear me now. Hear me, 22. 22. Anybody that should have raised your hand, if you were 23, 24, 25, but you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have, you can get your stuff too. Get your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff. Bring a friend if you need to. I want you to get in the aisle, meet me right here in front. Now, wait a minute. No one leaves during this period of time. The Holy Spirit's drawing people close. You don't need to be rude and walk out these doors. I'll let you go in just a moment. Let's wait for these people. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Lord, I give you my heart. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. Come on home. Come on home. Every breath that I Well, thank God you guys have come. Real quick, everybody, put a smile on your face. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. I want you to look to your left, see this guy waving at you. His name is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave is a really good guy. No weird stuff goes on whatsoever. He's going to do three things. One, he's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. Second, he's going to give you some free information. The word free is always a big word around this church. Take it home, read about what to do next now that you're a Christian. It's absolutely free. And thirdly, he's going to introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. That's where you meet somebody for five weeks every week, five weeks going over some scripture, They'll pray for you during the week. Remember, you said you're going to give God all of your heart. You said you're going to give God all of your life. Let us help you to do it. In fact, if you give us the Rock Church World Outreach Center one year of your life, you will be so blessed. You won't know how to handle it. You will evangelize your family. You'll get people that you never thought saved that could be saved. Your whole life will change if you'll give us one year. But we're only asking at first just five weeks to go through a spiritual personal trainer program that we have that'll help you. So give us that and watch God do something great in your life. Could you make a left turn now and follow Pastor Dave right over this way? Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.